And our next speaker is also a passionate but um, clear-headed uh, warrior for a less chemically dependent society. We hear a lot from him and he always makes sense. Professor Doug Selman, Director of the National Addiction Centre. Tēnā koutou katoa, he mihi nui ki te mana whenua o tēnā rohi, no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Well, um, this is an, another superb meeting uh, being organised by, by Ross Bell and I just want to congratulate Ross for, for, the, for another uh, of these series and we look forward to, to more of these to come and I'm particularly impressed, Ross, that you've got Jim, Jim Mora, um, to, to come and, and chair the meeting today and it's, it's actually terrific to actually meet you in, in, in the flesh, Jim. Um, we've done a lot of talking on the phone and I uh, really appreciate the opportunities you've given us uh, you know, to, and, and I know how supportive you are about addiction treatment and it's really appreciated. And um, it's, 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 a, it's a true honour to, to follow on from, from Tom. Um, if I was asked who are the five most important people in addiction treatment in the world, Tom would definitely be on that, on that, uh, on that list. And his paper that he wrote on chronic illness and how to manage it and addiction as a chronic illness is something that we, we actually have in our, uh, both our medical student teaching and our postgraduate teaching. Um, and as my, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm feeling that I'm, I'm just in the wake here of, of, of Tom, and I'm gonna be making a few comments. Don't know if you've seen the byline um, on reimagining addiction treatment. Hell begins on the day when God gives, grants us a clear vision of all that we might have achieved, of all the gifts which we have wasted, and of all that we might have done which we did not do. I think it's a, it's a terrific um, comment uh, and quote, particularly at this mo moment of time because of the way in which our health system is really having a bit of a shake up uh, by a right wing government. Um, when this happens, there are opportunities. And, 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 and I think that we should not be too uh, downhearted about where things are at, uh, but, but see some opportunities. And I'm gonna get onto that a, a little bit later. So, um, the key points I'm going to be making today um, is re reiterating recovery from addiction takes time. Therapeutic apartheid, I want to introduce this term therapeutic apartheid, is holding us back as a, a sector. Integration with mainstream services is not rocket science and I'm going to present a, a quick case to, to try and illustrate some of that. And the advantages, fourthly, of the advantages of change outweigh the risks, but there are some significant risks. But before I get onto it, I, I do want to paint the, uh, the, the, the context. There is a social context in which addiction treatment exists, and that is um, a world where behind every addiction is an industry pushing a Moorish product. And in our modern world, we have a, a proliferation of products that are addictionogenic. And behind every addiction, there is an industry scheming to make you and your children one of their favorite customers for life. And the alcohol industry is spending $300,000 every day of the year in New Zealand on marketing, and in terms of their advertising and marketing, and it's directed towards our children. And behind every thriving addictionogenic industry is a very appreciative government. Uh, Tom, this is our Prime Minister, um, <laughs> who we know has uh, significant personal uh, investment in the alcohol industry. And so you can see the tensions that are there in society when we come to talk about addiction and addiction treatment. So I just want to, uh, thanks for letting me just get that off my chest. Um, I, do, I do want to get that out, and that's the context in which we've got to think about addiction treatment, some of these forces. One of the big words that, that, that Tom has brought to us is the whole way in which addiction treatment is segregated from mainstream society. So it's alcoholics, drug addicts, and pathological gamblers that way, the rest of society uh, over, over here. And in some ways I see Tom as the, the uh, Nelson Mandela of the in international addiction treatment uh, sector. And his message is that we've really got to free up and we've got to, we've got to free up our, our, our services and become integrated into the mainstream. 
So, um, some initial comments about how it takes time. Th this illustration here is uh, two ways of losing weight. On the left hand side is how not to do it in five weeks with a crash diet because almost always there is the rebound to a higher level than where the person started from. On the right is the right way of doing it or the effective way of doing it over five years, lifestyle change over five years, steady, steady change over time. And this is so similar to when we think about drug addiction. The, the quick fix, detox and intensive short-term program almost always uh, ends in the 110% relapse rate. And what we need is, is a much calmer but longer term look at the way in which we bring about treatment. One of my uh, mentors here in New Zealand, uh, as, as many of you know, who died tragically in a, a house fire in 1998, Dr. John Dobson, um, used to talk a lot about the cholecystectomy model of addiction treatment. Here is a, you can see there, is a, a gallbladder full of um, stones being taken out. We treat addiction like it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's an acute uh, uh, disease that there is a surgical uh, um, solution uh, there. It, this, is, this is not the way to think about addiction treatment. Change takes time. Dalai Lama didn't become the happiest man in the world uh, just by changing his mind one day. He put in the hard yards over a long time. He did very, and he still does, he maintains his great happiness through hard work over time. Another icon in our field, who Tom knows a lot better than I do, is George Valent. And he said in 19, 1988, what is needed is that addicts, actually I, I'd prefer if he said people with addiction, um, and I'm sure he probably would say that these days, alter their whole pattern of living. Lifestyle change is what it's about. And we've developed this way of thinking about recovery through these four phases in relation to lifestyle change. Phase one treatment is picking up the pieces from a failed lifestyle. Not everything has to be thrown out. There's a lot of good that's, that's in people that, that must be retrieved as part of treatment. Phase two is rehabilitation, when this, a new lifestyle is being assembled uh, with the person, or for the person, or by the person for themselves, in fact. Phase three, a phase that we are, are totally missing, I think, in terms of our treatment services, um, in, in any sort of concerted manner, is practicing the new lifestyle. And this is what continuing care uh, is. And then phase four is living the new lifestyle in self-management. Just, a, just one slide on recovery, because we use this word in, in, in two different ways. And I think it's useful to be clear about which way we're using it. Um, the first is recovery from a disorder. And, and I think that that's the way that Tom was using it earlier. And it's the way uh, the DSM system, it's the way AA thinks about it. There is a, we're talking about a patient who's got a disorder. Recovery from addiction, however, in terms of continuous long-term abstinence, um, only occurs less than 10% of the time. And that's, that's a reality. That's, that's why we, we, we're talking about it being a chronic relapsing disorder. However, um, our Mental Health uh, Commission has, uh, has influenced us all over the last five to 10 years to be thinking of recovery in a new way, an empowerment model, recovery of a worthwhile life, despite having a chronic condition. And the focus here is on people being citizens. And it's a, it's a focus on their functioning. And more than 90% of people with addiction can, can achieve um, a, a new position of having a worthwhile life. Okay, now, I'm gonna give you a case here. This is the case of John. It's, it's actually the case that was, uh, was, was, was worked up uh, by a group of colleagues, I had a small input into this for the workforce review at the current time. So he's a 35-year-old Pākehā man who is in a five-year relationship with, um, with a partner and three stepchildren. And he works as a jib stopper and they all live in a housing New Zealand house. His addiction history is that he's been smoking and using cannabis, smoking cigarettes and using cannabis for the last 20 years. Since living with his new partner, He's, been, be, he's begun drinking alcohol increasingly heavily. Now eight to 10 stubbies of beer 
most evenings, and he has moderate to severe alcohol dependence. And recently, he's added to it by using methamphetamine with binges lasting two to three days at a time, occurring once or twice a month. But he doesn't actually meet criteria for dependence on methamphetamine. Other relevant history, his partner Mary, who is pregnant, is one of the 30 to 40 percent of people who are pregnant who do drink during pregnancy. But she drinks half of what John does and doesn't think it's an issue. John also suffers from periods of significant depression since his mid-teens, prior to his onset of alcohol dependence, which had become more severe in recent years, exacerbated, however, by his heavy drinking. He's been, he, is, he has seen his GP in the past for treatment of depression, but the GP has now been alerted to his heavy drinking, only because Mary turned up for help because she had bruising around her neck following an altercation when they were both intoxicated. So addiction treatment in the 1990s, let's look back um, last century. The GP writes a referral from John to the local community addiction treatment service. The service has a six week waiting list for assessment. Four weeks later, John receives a letter, a copy of his letter to his GP informing he's not eligible for assessment because he's got significant depression. However, an urgent referral has been sent on to the Mental Health Service. The Mental Health Service also has a six-week waiting list for assessment. And four further weeks later, John receives a copy of another letter to his GP informing him that he's not eligible for assessment there because he's got a significant alcohol problem. John's GP is rather exasperated and refers John to a local addiction treatment program run by an NGO. John completes the four-week residential program, becoming abstinent from all drugs except cigarettes, and feels somewhat better and returns home feeling he's got this addiction thing beat. He's had the cholecystectomy. Two weeks later, John and Mary have a small argument, and John relapses into heavy drinking and within a few days becomes severely depressed. Mary rings the NGO and is informed that John should come to the AA meeting in three days' time, after which he could see a staff member. Mary is scared, she withdraws from John and cries a lot. John is angry and feeling totally hopeless, goes on a methamphetamine alcohol bender. Two days into it, he drives his car at high speed over the centre line, colliding with an approaching car. Both John and the other driver are killed. John's GP is shocked when he reads about this event in the newspaper, but then shrugs his shoulders and thinks, as he always has, what a waste of time and money it is to try and treat alcoholics and drug addicts in the health system. Mary is deeply distraught and blames herself. For the next six months, she drinks heavily and subsequently delivers a highly irritable baby, four weeks premature, who's diagnosed as having ADHD six years later. Okay, let's uh, consider a miracle happens. Uh, perhaps this is the hand of Tom. Um, <laughs> Addiction treatment in the 2020s, same case. The GP refers Mary to the practice nurse who happens to have a postgraduate diploma in addiction treatment working there at the, at the practice who sees her that afternoon. John and Mary are then seen together by the nurse and an appointment the next day. The nurse and GP meet briefly and John is subsequently prescribed naltrexone, invited to continue sessions with Mary and the nurse which he takes up. John is reviewed four weeks later by his GP and is feeling somewhat better. His drinking has virtually stopped and his depression is improving. The nurse has added in uh, nicotine replacement therapy at John's request. It's not rocket science. It actually says, well, so much for a clean getaway. F means forward and R means reverse, Vince. It's not rocket science. Anyway, addiction treatment in the 2020s. Two weeks later, John and Mary have a small argument and John relapses into heavy drinking and within a few days becomes severely depressed. Mary rings the practice nurse saying she is scared because she seems so he seems so angry and desperate. The nurse consults the GP immediately. The GP rings the addiction specialist for urgent advice. John is admitted that afternoon to an addiction crisis bed for 48 hours. He is discharged back home on an antidepressant. His naltrexone is doubled. A referral to a local NGO recovery course has been made with ongoing monitoring by the GP and practice nurse who are continuing to see the pregnant Mary. It's not rocket science. Actually, it reads, as a matter of fact, it is rocket science. <laughs> what we're talking about isn't rocket science. 
John begins the two-year NGO recovery course, which incorporates an ongoing Facebook group for people who are depressed and drinking too much. Our minister talked about technologies. He's absolutely right. And over the next few months, begins to, to feel considerably better. The GP completes an e-learning update on alcoholic depression and is considering doing further addiction study because he's enjoying treating people with addiction and coexisting problems so much. The practice nurse gives Mary information about the risk of FASD through any alcohol use in pregnancy and she immediately ceases drinking. Mary delivers a healthy baby at six months later whom John adores. John and Mary's relationship deepens as John's commitment to abstinence now from all drugs including tobacco. So, addiction treatment, where are we going? Here's a, a, a fairly busy slide, but here's, let's say, the 1990s. This is where we are at the moment. 80% of the response to addiction is happening in specialist care, but the specialist care is not even in the centre of specialist care. It's off, to the, it's, it's off to the side. That's where we are. Very small here. 80% here, 20% there. What we need to do, first of all, is double the addiction treatment, the specialist side of addiction treatment, I believe. There's been an under-investment under in addiction treatment at a specialist level. That needs to be doubled. But we've got to get the, we've got to get the ratio round the other way so that the primary care response is 80% and the, and, and the specialist is 20%. It has to get away that way around, which means we need a 32% percent increase in the primary care response to addiction. That doesn't necessarily more me mean more money. It's, it's, it's largely an attitude uh, shift uh, that, that's required. So the potential advantages of breaking down therapeutic apartheid are these. Many more people with addiction related problems will get treatment. The quality will improve. The comprehensiveness will expand. Recovery rates, uh, as, as Tom has argued, uh, will get better, stigma will decrease, and work satisfaction of staff across the two domains uh, will increase. The main risk, as I'm seeing it, is the specialist care budget gets plundered to expand the primary care response. We are fairly fragile already in terms of specialist treatment skills. We may lose that more if this occurred we would get increased demoralisation with even greater staff turnover than we have at the moment, and that is concerning. And we could experience a, a, a collapse of the specialist uh, sector back to a voluntary sector only. Um, that is possible. So the key points, recovery from addiction takes time, therapeutic apartheid is holding us back, integration with mainstream services is not rocket science, and the advantages of change outweigh the risks but there are significant risks. Thank you very much. Thank you,